And Father, we thank you for this afternoon, Lord. We thank you that, uh, Lord, let our words and actions be sanctified that they might enhance your kingdom here on this coast. Not only on the coast, Lord, but every other place that we travel to and wherever our footsteps take us. Father, we pray that the anointing that we carry and the presence that we carry continually enhance your kingdom wherever we are. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this afternoon could be a little bit different. I, uh, when Suzette asked me a couple of weeks ago to uh, do this um, as is normally my custom, I went to the Lord and said, okay, well, so what do we do? What, 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 do, we, what do we want to talk about? And he gave me a, an indication which I wasn't all that fussed on. So I'm, I'm pretty sure I thought at least if I didn't say out loud, is there anyone else I can talk to? Um, <laughs> could I get a second opinion from a higher authority? And uh, so we went around in circles and I did ask another three or four times, but uh, here we are back to where I started. So it's probably no great surprise in that. Um, really what I want to share this afternoon is pretty much me from the heart. Um, my perspective on a lot of stuff is probably a bit different to most, um, but that's okay. It um, doesn't necessarily mean it's right or wrong or anything else, because we're all unique individuals with unique life experiences, spiritual experiences, uh, impact and influence by parents, teachers, peers, life experience, spiritual experience and everything else. So we can all look at a similar thing but have a different kind of perspective of it. My, my personal uh, perspective is, is very much a, a practical one. Um, and not necessarily always be the right one but it's fairly practical in the sense that I sort of tend to look at stuff and go, well, is that working right? Uh, if not, what do we need to do to change it? Um, how can we fix it? How can we make it work better and so on? That's probably filtered through a lens that's you know, logical in, in my thought process, um, but also just my nature and who I am but also um, the ministry calling that I have. About 32 or three years ago, um, the Lord spoke to me quite clearly one night when I was getting a bit of prayer and uh, study, and he spoke to me out of Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 to 10, and that was the ministry call. I was reasonably impressed at the time, but did not have a clue what it meant. Um, but called me very directly out of Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 to 10. And it's been an unfolding process over the last 30 years, particularly in the last 20 years as I've travelled to different countries around the world. Um, and, and it's almost like each verse has had its time to unfold and we're very much down to the pointy end of verse 10 now. So verse 9 and 10 says this. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See this day I have set you over nations and over kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and to plant. And verse 10 is the entire purpose in going to Uganda. I'm at a point in life, and I mean, praise God, um, I'm not interested in getting on a plane and going somewhere and preaching some nice, warm, fuzzy, comfortable message. I couldn't care less. Been there, done that, and I don't know that I did it all that well, but went and did it anyway by the grace of God. My attitude now is simply this. Um, if I can't go and make a difference then I'll stay at home and watch TV and please send somebody who can. Yeah. I mean, I'm not interested in flying halfway around the world to preach a bunch of warm, fuzzy, comfortable messages in a few churches and get on a plane and come home and think, well, yeah, I've done well, because I no doubt have it. Last year in Kenya and Uganda, there were three pivotal points 
and this year is to go back basically and build on that or in many respects confront it. The three pivotal points came, one in Kenya, where we were doing an open air meeting. There was only about 18 or 20 of us in this meeting and as the meeting started, about a kilometre away there was a rain or a line of hills and on the other side was Lake Victoria. And we'd been on the lake prophesying and, and, and blowing the shofar and, and, and there was a pastor there with us who said, my great-grandfather led my family to Jesus and prophesied that one day somebody would come and deal with the spirits, the water spirits in the lake who periodically demand human sacrifice. And as it turned out on that particular day, we were standing on the shore of Lake Victoria blowing the shofar, prophesying and declaring and decreeing uh, that he said, hey, you know what, my great-grandfather prophesied about this. That night, we were in an open-air meeting, and as the meeting started from these, on the other side of these hills, there was hundreds, maybe thousands, of demons coming up over the hill uh, towards the meeting. And we stopped and just started praying in the spirit and blew the shofar, and it was kind of funny, uh, because it was kind of, yeah, no. And they just went back behind the hill. That happened again in the car park of a church in Uganda about three weeks later and there was another pivotal moment there as we got out of the car park or got out of the car and walked towards the church and whoa! And there's hundreds, maybe thousands coming from one direction. We stood there and prayed, blew the shofar and the, the angelic host came from the opposite direction and the demonic horde just went again, yeah. No, nah. <laughs> it was quite funny to to what quite I, I've, both of those things I've I've never seen or experienced anything like it in my life, and the third one was on the shores on a hill just overlooking uh, Lake Victoria where the Nile River comes out. And the Nile River flows out of the northern end of Lake Victoria and flows north up through uh, Africa through to Egypt into the Mediterranean. And as we stood uh, on a hill overlooking the Nile River, the word came that just as the Nile flows north, bringing natural water and life uh, to North Africa, so too there will be a fire of revival starting in East Africa that will flow north, bringing life and revival through North Africa, and it will cross the Mediterranean and, and, and enter into Europe. So this is very much to go back and deal with the things that are trying to hold that. And, and I, I've said to Gwyn a couple of times in the past, and I'm kind of already wandering off the track of the notes, but anyway, what a surprise. My, my perspective in the last 12 months has been very much on the idea that in, in natural wars, not so much the First World War, but to a degree, but certainly in the Second World War, Korean War, Vietnam, Iraq, and some of the conflicts since, whoever held control of the air, whoever had air superiority, had a massive advantage on the ground. I would sort of submit, and this is just my opinion for whatever it's worth, for the most part, in many respects, and when I talk about the church, I'm talking about the church in the global sense, not necessarily a specific church. Uh, certainly not specifically open heaven, but I'm just talking in general terms. So it is a bit like painting a landscape with a five-inch brush. You do miss a bit of the detail and it's kind of broad strokes. But what I've seen globally, the church is trying fairly desperately to win a ground war without ever taking control of the atmosphere. Yeah. And I can tell you in places like Pakistan, India and any other, I mean, really, in Australia, wherever, what is manifesting on the streets of our cities at ground level is only what's being allowed and tolerated in the demonic in, in the atmosphere. What you allow in the atmosphere, what you don't take control over in the atmosphere, what you don't dethrone in the atmosphere will ultimately manifest in the streets and the homes of your city. 
So my view is one that's very sort of hands-on and practical. Um, let's do some damage to the demonic kingdom. I mean, let's, let's get in there, rip it apart, rip it down, dethrone it, disenfranchise it, and do some damage. Uh, and, I mean, forgive me if that sounds a bit, uh, a bit uh, impetuous or whatever, but um, that's me. <laughs> Sorry, that's, that's me. I mean, I, I, a very practical sort of a hands-on approach. Many years ago, and Suzette knows the people very well, this again is probably 38 years ago, maybe 36 or 7, whatever. Uh, it was actually Wendy on this occasion. I was, I'd only been saved probably five years. I was still wet behind the ears, didn't know which way was up. Uh, that, by the way, is still a work in progress. Um, I was standing at the front of the church at the time talking to the senior minister's wife. And she said to me, Michael, what do you, what do you want to do? Because Barb and I, at the time, I think we, we had just started in uh, as youth pastors and youth minister was their first job in ministry. And uh, I had fairly thick black hair at that stage. And youth, youth ministry is when it started turning grey and falling out. Um, but Wendy, Wendy said, what, what is it you want to do? And without thinking too much about it, I said, I want to see the church be all that it can be, stand up and be all that it is intended to do. And, and I didn't really have a clue what I was saying. And it was a rather grandiose sort of a statement for a guy who'd been saved for about five years and was still wet behind the ears. But basically, I haven't changed. I mean, what I said then, albeit as a fairly naive, in a naive kind of a moment, my basic desire and basic concept hasn't changed. I mean, I, I want to go to Uganda or wherever, and um, if you happen to be praying or think of it, next year uh, we're looking at Tanzania and Madagascar um, and a couple other places, so this is ongoing. But, you know, to... to to have the churches in those places be all that they can be, because so often, uh, you know, the church at large in many of these places, you know, pastors are looking at building their building and gathering people and increasing their ministry profile and, uh, I mean, 101 different things, which all may have various levels of virtue, but none of it is about seeing the church being all that it can be in the land and ripping down demonic strongholds and releasing the kingdom and the justice and the mercy and the grace of the kingdom in the, in the nation. So I sort of said to Wendy, well, I want the church to be all that it can be. So this is my sort of fairly practical, I suppose, approach. That was about 35 years ago, give or take. Within that concept, let's just say the church to be all that it can be and all that it's intended to do. The Cold Coast at the moment probably has at least 200 churches. Brisbane, goodness knows how many. Um, how are we doing so far? Yeah. I'm seriously? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not trying to be smart and I'm certainly not trying to be insulting. But, I mean, if we look at the state of society, if we look at the state of governments, if we look at what's happening in our societies, and, and there's 200 churches on the Gold Coast, and, yeah, maybe a 1,000 in Brisbane, I don't know, much less Sydney and other places, what sort of an impact are we really having? I mean, are we winning territory and gaining territory and moving forward? Are we changing the face of society? I mean, are we going forwards, backwards, holding our ground? I mean, I mean, just how's the church doing? Well, what's the six o'clock news? Uh, and I don't, I don't mean that in any disparaging way, but it's just, well, if not, why not? 
And, and if not, do we maybe need to change a couple of things or look at something different because one of the old definitions of insanity is keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. <laughs> so, you know, if, if, we, if we look at the impact that the church is having on the society today and we go, okay, well, you know, it might be a fairly limited impact, well, that then poses the question, well, what do we need to change? Because if we want a different result, we've probably got to change what we're doing. Because otherwise, if we keep doing the same thing, we're going to you know, keep getting the same result, which I might submit it thus, thus far, uh, hasn't been all that radical. Let's anchor in a couple of scriptures and then pose another question. Exodus 12, 7, I so glad says prayed uh, earlier with the blood because the blood is inseparable from the destiny and the purpose of the nation. See, we can look at a lot of things from the blood of the Passover lamb in Exodus chapter 12. Time doesn't permit us today, but here's one thing. And, and you prayed so well about the blood on the doorpost and lintels and so on of the nation and the city. The blood of the lamb was shed and in the basin. Then they used a bunch of hyssop to transfer the blood from the basin to the doorpost and the lintels. While the blood was in the basin, it served no purpose whatsoever. The destiny and the purpose of the nation depended entirely on the transfer of the blood from the basin to the doorpost. No transfer, no destiny, no purpose, still in bondage. It only came into effect when there had been a successful transfer. Now, the blood of, the, of Jesus, our Passover lamb, it says, has now been shed for the whole world. Because there's a progressive shedding of blood from Genesis. There's a shedding of blood from an individual. There's God made skins from, and shed the blood of innocent lambs for their covering. So blood is shed for an individual in Genesis, for a family in Exodus, for a nation in Leviticus, and the whole world when we come to Jesus. So the blood has been shed, but it's in the basin. The church needs to ensure there is a successful transfer from the basin to the nation. And if we keep preaching great messages and whatever the case, but we're not transferring the blood from the basin to the nation, then there is no release of destiny to the nation. Does that make sense? In Revelation, uh, it says, they overcame him, being the devil, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Yeah. So in the Old Testament, the transfer was achieved by the bunch of hyssop, like a paintbrush. In the New Testament, we do spiritually what they did naturally. The word of our testimony takes the place of the bunch of hyssop. So now when the word of our testimony, when we begin to say, Father, I declare in the name of Jesus, Australia is redeemed. I call Australia redeemed, sanctified, cleansed, and set free through the blood of Jesus. And we begin to testify what the blood of Jesus says about our nation, then now we're doing what we're intended to do and create a successful transfer. Let me just read a couple of other scriptures here. So Exodus 12, 7, They shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and upon the upper door posts of the houses where, where they shall eat it. Then in verse 12, so we're, we're in chapter 12, so these are all verses in chapter 12. Exodus 12, 7 is the first one. 12, 12 is the next one. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and I'll smite the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. 
So when the doorpost is, when the blood has been transferred, it now requires the judgment of the Egyptian gods. That'd be nice. There's a few, few Egyptian gods out there that need to be judged. But, but no transfer, no effect. No transfer, there's no destiny of the nation being released and there's no gods of Egypt being re- judged. It all depends upon the believers making the transfer. So let's go down to verse 14. And this day shall be unto you a memorial and shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. And you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Forever. Not three days, six months. You shall keep it as an ordinance forever. Verse 24. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance for thee and thy sons Forever. So verse 20, 14, he said, you, you're going to keep this ordinance forever. Verse 24, he repeats it. You think he might be trying to emphasise a point here? Verse 25, and I'll come to pass when, uh, shall come to pass when you come into the land which the Lord shall give you, according as he has promised, you'll keep this service. You'll keep it forever twice and when you come into the land that he gives you, you, you'll keep it as a service. Do you think he could be trying to make a point here, mm-hmm. emphasising this? And uh, in Joshua 1, 2, it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, bow on all these people to the land I give them, even the ch- children of Israel. Well, you'll keep this as an ordinance forever, twice. When you come into the land that I give you, you'll keep this service. And in this case, Israel was given the promised land. We're here in our promised land. Mm -hmm. If the blood, when there was a successful transfer, released the destiny and the purpose of the nation, and required the judgment of the gods of Egypt, how are we doing so far? I would submit, respectfully, the church at large might need to change a couple of things. Because we look at it and go, okay, well, let's look at the state of society. Uh, How much destiny are we releasing? How much purpose are we releasing? How much kingdom is being established? Maybe we need to change a couple of things, but that's just my kind of practical perspective. Let, let's wind the clock back a bit and look at what's happened in the church. Jesus came and then uh, we, when he ascended back into heaven in the book of Acts and so on at the time, he came into a world that was absolutely pagan. With the exception of Israel, and of course they they were having their various ups and downs, but the world, the known world at that time, was absolutely pagan. It was dominated largely by three gods and various manifestations of them. Baal, Astaroth, in various manifestations, Ishtar, Aphrodite, Venus, Diana, whatever, and Moloch. Dominated by various manifestations of those. And Jesus came into that environment, preached the kingdom, demonstrated the kingdom. From the book of Acts onwards, they continued to preach and demonstrate demonstrate, demonstrate the kingdom and as a result over the next three, four, five hundred years the powers of darkness and these pagan gods were basically dethroned and disenfranchised. As the kingdom of God 
And as the Christian gospel began to spread about the known world, the temples fell into disrepair, the gods were disenfranchised, and the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven took a, a, an apostolic transition and, and it began to advance as the light spread through the darkness through the known world, there was a disenfranchising of the old pagan gods. And the temples fell into disrepair and the gods lost favour and so on. And everything was great. Four or five hundred years, six hundred years. And then historically, religion started to replace relationship. The Queen of Heaven cult took over massively. Uh, through for the sake of YouTube, I might not mention the church, but we know who it is. So the Queen of Heaven cult took over. The world then slipped into the Dark Ages for about a thousand years. And then starting about the 1500s, somewhere in the 1500s, I think it was when the first Bible was printed, but from about the 1500s onwards, you had the Bible being printed, people being able to read the Bible in their own language through the 16th, 17th and 1800s. There was various uh, doctrines restored, ministries restored, gifts restored. We had the, the Great Wealth Revival, the Azusa Street Revival, various other revivals and great things happening. Coming into the 1940s and 50s in the US, and I'm kind of painting this with a five inch brush, but coming into the US we had great tent revivals and great healing revivals and multitudes saved and everything is now coming out of the dark ages, moving forward at a fairly great rate of knots and then we've got what we've got today. What happened? What was there some pivotal moment? What yeah, you know, we've come from all these restorations and great revivals and great tent revivals and uh, you know what what where did we what happened? Well let me let me suggest in the States and I think it was mid sixties, somewhere thereabouts, prayer was taken out of the schools. When you take something out of the spiritual realm, there is no such thing as a vacuum. When you remove one thing, something else will replace it. When you remove something good, unless you replace it with something good, something dark will come in and take its place. Then on the back end of that, we had Woodstock and you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll and the whole revolution that started to come through uh, the states and of course from the states spread through throughout various other uh, various other nations and and then like, like things just kind of went from bad to worse to to where we are now is it possible that as there has been spiritual vacuums left by taking uh, prayer out of schools, by, by taking the Ten Commandments down, I think, which were up in, in courthouses. And, you know, there's been a whole shift away in government and media and so on from, from uh, you know, Christian values and perspectives. Is it possible that the old gods have returned. They spent a thousand years in the shadows, is that maybe they've returned. Well, Baal, there were many Baals. Baal was the substitute god. So there were many truths being substituted for the one truth. So we are now effectively, let me submit this to you, we are now effectively living in the time of judges where the scripture says, Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Yes. 
that kind of sound a bit familiar? The good thing after the book of Judges comes the book of Ruth. <laughs> so there is at least something good on the back end of it. So we've now got the first entrance is Baal. Many truths. New Age, be your own God. Be, seek your own truth. Find your own truth. Baal opens the door or the portal to Asherah, Astroth, Aphrodite, whatever you want to call the same thing. Now, Baal is the substitute God. Find your own truth. Many truths. And once there are many truths, you've completely dismantled the truth. Astroth is, if nothing else, the absolute corrupter of society. Astroth, in her many uh, forms and incantations, is responsible for witchcraft and sorcery is responsible for absolute gender fluidity and, and, and um, transgenderism. Her priests, the men, were dressed as women. The, the women were masculinised. So this whole thing we see in society now is nothing more than a re-establishment of the old god, Astroth. Ishtar, Aphrodite, whatever you know, form you want to do it. But what we're seeing throughout society now goes back to Baal comes in as the substitute God and make your own God and be your own truth and find your own truth, opening the door to Astaroth, which then comes in and completely, uh, completely corrupts society. And, and she is associated... Uh, with absolute promiscuity, with transgenderism, with gender fluidity, and all the things that we are seeing manifest in society today are manifestations of this goddess. Yep. Moloch. Back then, they sacrificed their children by the thousands for the favours of Moloch, Today, child sacrifice, I think in the last decade there was something like 60 million abortions in the US. 60 million. Back then it was by the tens of thousands, now it is by the millions and that was just in the US, much less goodness knows the rest of the world. So you have the Baal, the many truths, Find your own truth. Astroth, the absolute corrupter of society, gender fluidity, transgenderism, promiscuity, witchcraft, the whole package. And then you've got Moloch, who provides the blood sacrifice by the millions. And that's without, uh, you know, child trafficking and so on. I mean, it's, <laughs> oh, the old God's back. Oh, yeah. You better believe it. So, what do we do? In the time of Jesus in the book of Acts, as they preached and demonstrated the kingdom, the gods were pushed back, disenfranchised, dethroned. Israel's greatest problems came when they tried to live in coexistence with the strange gods, with the gods of other nations. It became a snare to them and resulted in disaster, which inevitably led to judgment and captivity. I would submit respectfully that the church globally today, and again, I'm painting the picture with a five-inch brush. There's always exceptions in detail and so on. But the church today is too inclined to kind of live in coexistence when it should be dethroning and pushing back. Because that's the template that we have. So what, 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 what can we do, need we do? Sometimes before, um, sometimes before diving into the fray, so to speak, there's a bit, you know, maybe 
Maybe before trying to change the world, we do need to change ourselves a little bit. Um, otherwise, we may get ourselves into a bit of strife. There are great templates in the Old Testament, great books of history, but we also need to understand that they are templates, plans, templates for us to follow, that we do spiritually what they did naturally, but nevertheless, here's the template. Joshua is a template. Here's what you should be doing. Possessing the land, you take down Jericho, which is the strong man, first bind the strong man, and then you subsequently take possession of the other cities representing various other levels of spiritual authority. And when you've done it, how do you do it? Well, you take the mayor or the king of the city as it is in Joshua and you hang his stinking carcass on a tree for all to see. I mean, Joshua is probably one of the most violent, bloodthirsty books when you read it. It is the level of violence and bloodthirstiness is astronomical. But that's the way we should be spiritually possessing the land and dispossessing the enemy. Here's the fundamental thing. The idea was you dispossess the Canaanites and the Canaanite gods. You have to first dispossess them before you can possess it yourself. The church at large has come into the land and for the most part tried to live in a coexistence without completely dispossessing the enemy strongholds. And as a result, we've got all sorts of troubles. Not intended to criticise the church or anyone in particular, but it's, just, it's just, just a simple reality. Nehemiah and Esther are two, two great templates. I mean, there's many others, but, and they're back to back, which is no accident either. Nehemiah deals with the restoration of the church and Esther, the very next book, deals with the character and the nature of the church. So you restore the church, and then when it's restored, here's its character and its nature. So Nehemiah um, is basically divided into three parts. It's the restoration of the walls and the city of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is always a type of the local church. So it's the restoration of the walls and the gates of Jerusalem, then it is the restoration of doctrine, and then it is the restoration of the people to the doctrine. So three parts. Restore the church, restore the doctrine, then restore the people to the doctrine. But it starts when somebody cares enough to ask, hey, well, what, what's the state of things here? And this is sort of the paraphrased version, but what's the state of things here? Well, quite frankly, pretty terrible. So now whoever takes the burden begins to pray and weep for the city and begins to pray and seek God based upon a covenant relationship. And there is a confession and a repentance of national sin, family sin and personal sin. Then subsequent to the prayer and the repentance, he then goes before the king the king, in turn, sends him with letters to the governors, which represent authority, letters to the keepers of the king's forest, which represents provision, and captains and horsemen, which represent power. You kind of see it New Testament style in Luke 9, 1, where he sent them with uh, power and authority. So he sent them there with, with letters to the governors, governors, so to speak, and with captains and horsemen. So now Nehemiah is in the position where he's taken the burden, he's prayed, approached God on covenant relationship, confessed national sin, family sin and personal sin. He's now in a position where he's going to do some restoration. 
And it's just a few men. He and a few men. I think it's in chapter 2. He and a few men with him. No big names. No, no kind of great, uh, you know, celebrities. Just he and a few men with him. And there is a, a magnificent spot there where there is the transfer of the vision from Nehemiah as the apostolic leader to the people. There is a transfer of vision and they say, let us rise up and build. Nehemiah says, you see the hand of God upon me, and they respond with, let us arise and build. There is a wonderful transfer uh, of, of vision. They then go into the rebuilding of the gates and the walls. Yeah, I mean, we need to get through this quickly. They then go into the rebuilding of the gates and the walls. One of the first things that we've got to notice there is that if you ever sign on for this, you're going to have to get well out of your comfort zone. Yes. Because those that were repairing the walls, you find they're the sons of the apothecaries, the sons of the goldsmith. Now, kid yourself not, this is a rough, hard, dangerous construction site. And, and you've got, you know, sons of apothecaries and... I mean, this is, I mean, modern language, I mean, this is a jeweller's son, probably never done any hard work in that sense in his life. Uh, this is a chemist or a pharmacist's son, probably never been out of the chemist shop and certainly never, neither one of those have ever worked on a rough, hard, dangerous building site. So it indicates to us, you know, that people are going to have to be well and truly able and willing to get out of their comfort zones. They repair the breaches in the walls. So we're talking about the church because Jerusalem is a type of the local church. So we're talking about breaches. The breaches have to be restored. There's any number of things in church life that can cause breaches. It can be bad leadership. It can be a lack of vision. It can be gossip. It can be criticism. It can be judgment. Uh, it can be any number of things that result, bad doctrine, whatever, you know, any number of those things, and I'm sure each of us would probably come up with a different list, but any number of those things that can result in breaches. So we may need to go back, and again, I'm speaking sort of broadly, there may well be a need in churches to say, okay, we need to go back and repent and deal with some stuff that we have allowed to cause breaches. Because a breach in the wall allows an enemy infiltration into the city. So when there's undealt with things like criticism, gossip, bad doctrine, leadership, no vision, whatever the case may be, it allows an infiltration by the enemy into the church. So sometimes there is a need to get before the Lord and say, okay, Lord, what breaches are we dealing with and how do we restore them? Yeah. Gates are different. Now, in this particular case, there's 12 gates in the city, but there's only six specifically referred to as being re restored and reset. And five of those six, it says the locks and the bars were reset. 12 speaks of apostolic government, 6 represents the flesh, and the 5, the locks and bars, represent the ascension gift, ministry and grace. So we can, it's well and truly talking about the church here. So we need to reset the gates. We understand what the breaches are, what are the gates? Now generally speaking in the Old Testament, gates represent authority. And there is a truth in that. But there's something else the Lord showed me just in the last couple of weeks. A gate is a place of entry and exit. It's a place of authority, but it's a place of entry and exit. It's a portal. Sometimes, and a portal is usually attached to an altar. So apart from the breaches, sometimes we need to purify the altars. That's simple. We need to purify the altars. 
Because this is the church that is going to be part of the next book, which is, which is Esther, that is a national deliverer. So they, they, they restore the walls and the gates, then they get to the point where the law is read and there's a restoration of doctrine, and then there's a restoration of people to the doctrine, and then there is a, a great time of repentance and so on. The book is well worth reading. But here's, there's a really interesting purpose in it. In chapter 8, this is of Nehemiah, from about verse 14 to 16, 17 there, they find in the place in the law where it is written that they should dwell in booths for the feast of the seventh month. And so they cut down branches and make booths, and the branches they cut, if you've got a King James Version, it will say olive, pine, myrtle, um, palm and thick branches. Now the thick branches there in the King James do not mean a thick trunk. They mean thick, dense foliage. So that's what's meant by thick branches, not, not, not thick trunks. If you have a new King James or another version, it may there say olive and wild olive. For some reason in the King James, wild olive is translated as pine. But it's correct translation, these booths are made out of Olive, wild olive, uh, palm, myrtle, thick branches, and these booths. You know, in Amos, um, what's it, chapter uh, 9, I think 11 and 12, there's a, there's a re really fascinating, oh, I found it fascinating anyway. Praise God. So let me try Amos 9, 11. In that day I'll raise up the tabernacle of David which has fallen, close up the breaches thereof and raise up its ruins, and I'll build it as in the days of old. That in verse 12, that they may possess the remnant of Eden, Edom and the heath in which are called by my name, saith the Lord who does this. And Peter, I think it is in the book of Acts, picks it up and mentions it again. Now you would think, logically and reasonably, the tabernacle of David is mentioned in 2 Samuel. You would think if Amos is prophesying about raising up the tabernacle of David, both are in the Old Testament, both are Hebrew, you would think that the word Amos uses for tabernacle would be the same as the word in 2 Samuel for the tabernacle of David. I mean, Amos is prophesying about raising up the tabernacle of David, surely, logically, rationally, it would be the same word. It's not. The tabernacle of David, it uses the word, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it uses the word ohel, which means tent. O-H-E-L. It means tent. But when Amos prophesies and says, in those days I will raise up the tabernacle of David, he doesn't use the same word. He uses the word that Nehemiah uses for booths. And therein lies the purpose. I'm going to raise up the booths which are made from olive and wild olive, which is the Jew and the Gentile, from myrtle, pine and thick branches, Myrtle is blessing, pine is victory, and thick branches, thick foliage represent the nations. So what he's saying is that I'm going to raise up the tabernacle of David, restore the breaches and raise up its runes, so that from the Jews and the Gentiles throughout the nations, it will be raised up in blessing and victory. And that's built into the prophecy of Amos. What was palm? Victory. Palm is victory. So palm. olive is Jew. Wild palm. olive is gentle. Gentile. Yeah. Gentle. Yeah. Gentile. Palm is victory. Myrtle is blessing. Myrtle. And the thick foliage represents the nations. So the Jews and the gentle, Gentiles from the nations be raised up in blessing and victory. So there was no 
Pine, yeah, pine, pine in the uh, King James is actually correctly translated wild olive. Oh, okay. Because it's so, the same King James. Yep. In the King James, you'll have olive and pine. Why it's translated as pine, I don't know. The correct, correct translation is wild olive. So t touching hmm. and feeding into something that I think Tom Inglis was talking about, and let's, let's wind it up with that. I've got a little bit more there, but let, let's wind it up. David's tabernacle was all about removing the furniture and re removing the blood and just free, uninhibited worship. When we look at the Old Testament, we find that there is the church, the tabernacle at Shiloh, which went on for a long time without the ark. The ark is actually over at Kirjath Jerim. And when you le read the commentaries, it looks as if it's very likely that the ark was not in the tabernacle at Shiloh for something in the order of 100 years. When you read different commentaries, look at it now, whether you know, it is 100 years or not, it is according to various commentaries, but it's certainly a very extended period of time. So you've got here where there's a lot of religious activity but no presence of God. Does that sound familiar? Most of the mainstream churches, with all due respect today, lots of religious activity, but no real hunger or emphasis on the presence of God. Then David goes and gets the ark. We're going to bring this back in. I mean, there's 30,000 or something from there, dancing, shouting, praising. And, and Uzzah has a very bad day, and the ark winds up in the house of Obed-Edom for three months. It speaks of a visitation, but not a habitation. Mm -hmm. And the ark was on a cart, which it never should have been in the first place. It should have been on the shoulders of the, of, of the Levites. Might I suggest that a lot of the Pentecostal church worldwide fit into this category because we have visitations without a habitation and the cart speaks of, yes, we hunger and, and all the rejoicing and praising. We hunger and rejoice for the presence of God, but we'll do it our way according to our structure and programs and whatever the case may be. And just in the sheer grace of God, we get a periodical visitation, but not a habitation. But what we're really wanting is the habitation. So David then goes back, and now it's on the shoulders of the Levites, and the doorkeepers and the captains and the, all the people are there. And it's gone past unity, because I think I've said this before, Unity is when we come together and we come together in the presence of God and we have a great meeting and great fellowship and you know, wonderful. Then we all go our separate ways and go home. That unity is broken. But when we go past unity into a commonality of purpose, then we can be spread across the world and our hearts are still knitted together in a commonality of purpose which is a desire and a hunger for the absolute presence of God above and beyond anything else. And we won't go there for the sake of time, but that's really where uh, Esther comes into it. The desire for the presence of God supersedes absolutely everything else. Amen. Nothing else matters. So we're gone from Shiloh, lots of religious activity, no presence of God, to Obed-Edom's house, which is there a visitation, to, to David's tabernacle, which is being raised up again on the basis of an absolute hunger and a desire for the presence of God that absolutely supersedes everything else. Nothing else matters. Our programs don't matter. Our preaching doesn't matter. 
Nothing else matters. The only thing that really has absolute precedence is the presence of God. Yeah. Nothing else matters. Then you see it. We'll finish with this. I think it's about the sixth finish, isn't it? You're doing good. I'm doing all right. You, you never give a preacher a microphone because when they say, and we'll finish with this, you never believe them. You all know that. I mean, you know, there's at least six finishes. And then plus three or four conclusions on the back end of that. So you see it in the Old in We've seen the Old Testament there. Shiloh, Obed, Edom, and the Tabernacle of David. It's there in the New Testament with the woman with the issue of blood. Because in the New Testament, the woman always represents the church. So there's a woman there who is slowly bleeding to death. Now, it seems a bit weird because... You know, in the New Testament, where we, we think of the blood coming on the church or the blood of Jesus coming on things. But Leviticus says the life is in the blood. So this woman is slowly bleeding to death. The life is in the blood. In other words, the church that is slowly hemorrhaging spiritually and the spiritual life is just slowly hemorrhaging out of it and it's dying. But she says, I've heard of this, I'm paraphrasing it again a little bit, but I know. I've heard of this Jesus. Maybe he can do something for me. So she turns away from all the doctors, which represent all the various programs and everything else that are in churches today. She turns away and at any and all expense and effort, she presses on and presses in and her only focus is the presence of Jesus. That's all. Even at the risk of her own safety, I'm turning away from the programs, I'm turning away from all the religious structures and whatever else. I am pushing, pressing, doing whatever it takes to get into the presence of Jesus. And we find there in that moment... Remember, we had Shiloh, Obed Edom's house, and David's tabernacle. What we've got here is a noisy crowd, a bunch of disciples, and one woman. So we've got the same three. Noisy crowd, Shiloh. Lots of people following Jesus down the road, but absolutely no intimacy and no relationship. Mainstream church today for the most part. We've got the disciples who are much closer and have a relationship, perhaps representing a lot of the Pentecostal church today, much closer, much, much better relationship. But even Peter, when Jesus says, who touched me? What do you mean? People all over the place. Uh, yeah, Peter still didn't sort of have a clue, I mean. And then there's the one woman... The one woman that touched him. She is immediately healed and made whole. And the spiritual, if you want to use it as a church type, the life that was flowing out of her is now instantly restored. And a woman with an issue of blood cannot get pregnant and give birth. A woman that is healed and made whole most certainly can so it's now the church that is not only healed and made whole, but it can reproduce. And so what, did, what does it really look like? What did she actually touch? Came up behind him, touched the hem of his garment, which was the mantle that had a white tassel in each corner with a blue thread through the tassel. The scripture says, God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. She's touched the tassel white, which represents truth and spirit, and, oh, sorry, truth and righteousness, and the blue thread is spirit. It's the church that pushes, presses, does whatever is necessary to get into the presence of Jesus and worships in spirit and truth, and in that moment, the virtue and the glory flow into the church and it steps out into the world able to reproduce. That's us. That's us. That's us. That's us. That's us. Amen.
<laughs> if not, why not? <laughs> that, that sort of will make a little bit of sense. Well, praise God. There's a bit more here, but I'm going to have mercy on you and I'm not going to do it. <laughs> let's, let's pray. I've just uh, written this prayer here. We, we, we need churches that will carry a burden with an apostolic prophetic ministry to repair the breaches, establish the altars, and focus on the king and deliver nations. Pretty simple, straight, straightforward stuff. Father, let's pray. Father, we lift up the church amongst the nations and pray that it be strengthened, that the breaches be closed and the altars purified and be established. We pray that such a church speak with clarity, righteousness, justice, and holiness to the nation. We pray that your church break down strongholds, destroy the altars of foreign gods, be all that it can be and all that was intended. That it be a bright beacon of hope and safety in the darkness. That it not only speak about the kingdom, but release its power, grace, and justice upon the earth. Amen.